Hi, Alan. Hi, Chris. Oh, is it Chris or Christopher? Which which is Chris, please. Right. I say I have Christopher just for my mom because she says she thinks it looks nice written down. And also, because of our accent, Len, and our background, I've noticed that if you if I use Christopher, those upstairs take me a bit more seriously. <laughs> so it's one of them little class tricks. <laughs> Certainly is. And did you did you have a nickname when you were a kid? I, I've read the book. By the way, I've read the book, but we'll talk about that, you know, as we go. Okay. But, but I don't remember there being a nickname in there. For, oh, uh, well, uh, Big Ears um, was a big nickname because right. I've got identical twin brothers. And yes, uh, actually, these headphones have flattened my ears a bit, but my brothers are really, and my dad's are, were really at right angles. And I've got one ear that sticks out a lot, so big ears, and right. uh, Eccles cake. Oh, Eccles cake, yeah, that's good. Yeah. That's good, that's regional. But basically, we were called Ecky or Ek. Oh, of course. How are you doing, Ecky? Ecky. Ecky. We grew up in similar, I mean, in the similar areas. Uh, Incredible, we, yeah. My buzz went through Little Alton, um, right. you know, from, from Atherton. And uh, it was just, uh, I, on reading, on reading the book and on seeing your story, I I got it. I got it. I got it from my end. You know, I got it from and, and Eki. Eki is the nickname. I, I think yeah. I might have known somebody called Eki from. Other probably school. did. Yeah. yeah. And and in the uh, sometime in the seventies, the the goodies did a television show. Uh, what an episode of the goodies, and they were doing this thing about black puddings and Eki thump. Ecky Thunk, yeah, I remember it. So I, I, I got loads of that, but it was the same for me reading about uh, Lee and Atherton. Um, and I, when I'm reading about you working for, what was his name, Underwood, the guy selling the bleach. Oh, Mr. Wadsworth. Wands, was it Wandsworth or Wadsworth? Gosh, I was I wondering, couldn't... you must have done our estate. You must have sold on our estate. So funny. Yes, I did. I will have done because we we went all over. Uh, we went to Little Ulton. We went to Little Ulton. I haven't even thought Little about it until now. I'm getting I'm getting goosebumps. Yeah, I, and, and Salford, and we did that bleach and washing up. Do you remember that? The bleach yeah. and washing up liquid that came in the big round. Yeah, yeah. yeah we put leaflets in. Yeah, um, Little Ulton walked in basically because the yeah, boundary between Little Ulton and walked in. Yeah, yeah. Farmworth. Um, Yep. Jim Cartwright, farmer, yeah. Jim Cartwright. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Because when that play, um, when Jim Cartwright wrote, rolled, yeah. uh, I went to see it at the Royal Court, and instead of doing it in the traditional proscenium arch, which is what I was expecting, yeah. they'd ripped the cross arch out, yeah. and they'd turned the theatre into a kind of empty warehouse, and all the actors... You had to follow, it was promenade production, it's called. You had to follow the actors about. And the fact that it wasn't Cross Arch and they were talking about farm worth and anger and unemployment is the greatest play I've ever seen. And Jim Cartwright, when I finally met him, said to me, The first fan letter I ever received in my life was from you. Wow. <laughs> I wrote to him. That's I wrote so to him. I was an unemployed, it was 86, I was unemployed, been out of drama school for a few years, couldn't get a job, and I wrote to him about the play. And you were that guy that wrote those letters, weren't you? You know, yeah. that's what you did. Yeah. Um, I think about, um, I love the way things come around, you know. Yeah, you know, I did, I did road at, at Royal Court. Yeah, that's and, why I brought and, it up. And I, and I met Jim as well, yeah. you know, and, and, and it, I found it very... It's a funny how the world co comes around because as difficult as it was to do that part, um, and I'm not an actor by trade, um, that was my life as well, you know? And, and when I was in that life, like you, um, I, I also felt like, I think they all did, all of those characters all felt like outsiders. Yeah. They were all together, but they were all felt like outsiders. Did you um, play Scullery? I like, played Scullery, yeah. Yeah. Now, who played Scullery when you saw it? When I saw it, it was 
Was it Hit Me With My Rhythm Stick or was it Edward uh, Pohl, Tudor Pohl? It was Ian Jury. Ian Jury, wow. Because it was the revival when they did it upstairs first. Yes, that's right. That was with Tudor Pohl, I think. With the, is that that's right. Name? Yeah. Yeah, Ed, Edward Tudor Pohl, who oh. I sometimes see in the French house in, yeah. Uh, yeah. in London. Yeah. Uh, lovely guy, yeah. wide open, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, it, yeah, it was Ian Jury. Got to say, I've got to say, um, I've got to say hello to you from a few friends of mine. Okay, and and that will we we can talk about them as well because am I going to blush, Lem? They're, no, they're good people, and and no, there's, I know. There's, I'm... there's great connections, and I think it puts me and you together as well. To it, um, Angela Pell. Now, Angela Pell, the name's going to drop at somewhere. She's writing close to me. Oh yes, which, yes, yes. Now here's the link. Here's the link. Does come around. That's strange. We were supposed to do it in the middle of April, and it got pushed, obviously. And now at the moment, we're hoping to do it end of August. Yes, that's right. That's right. That's what the next thing I was going to say to you. Angela Pell's husband is Henry Normal. Oh. Henry. Totally different careers, but that's Henry Normal. They both have uh, an autistic son. That's correct. Yeah, I know that. Very out about that. They wrote the drama Snowflake, Snow. I think it was called Snowball or Snowfall, and uh, it was star Sigourney Weaver. Oh, okay. Uh, and it was all about uh, autism. And that was directed by a friend of mine. <laughs> there you go, Mark Mark Evans. Right. I think it was directed by Mark Evans. Right. A director friend of mine. Right. That's that makes sense. Exactly. Yeah, but it is beautiful. It's beautiful because um, she's an incredible person. So that's the first one. She says hello. Oh, <laughs> and she's back. really excited. And she's having Zoom meetings right now, obviously, about the production, etc. cetera. Um, Denise Goff. Now, Denise Goff won two Olivier Awards um, for – she did People, Places and Things at the National. In that small theatre. That's right. And she also – Angels of America. Right. And she, I'm a, she thinks I'm aware, world, I'm aware of her, but I've never met her. She asked me to say hello to you yesterday. Thank you. She's an actor's actor. She's an actor. Well, you're an actor's actor, you see. That's why, <laughs> you know, I was calling her last night to tell her. I was taking lines from here because I was saying, Denise, he's one of you. He's one of us. <laughs> meaning, meaning, meaning when you, in your childhood, Oh, it was what your father said to you. He said, uh, oh, he's off. Chris is off. It was something like, oh, he's off. And it's that, it's that, it's that look, it's that intensity. And it's that. Oh, yeah. And, and, and Denise has that as well. So, yeah. good people. Carl, I'll stop in a minute, Chris. Chris but it's all Carla, right. Obviously, Carla Henry. Carla, yes. Yeah. Played my sister. Yeah. In, in Revenge's Tragedy. Yeah. But do well, you I find... should... Go on. Go on, then. You, well, you're a natu you're, you're, we're naturally want to talk about the other, which is a good sign. I just want to say, I feel I'm on my second read through your book. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm not a particularly emotional person, but yeah. it was at the beginning of this Zoom meeting when we had the other two people with us, I actually found it quite difficult to look at you because, yeah. not that it's a big deal, but I feel like yeah. I'm about to burst in burst into tears because yeah. I'm on my second way through it. And last night I was in bed and um, I'm divorced and I don't see my children yeah. enough, but Wednesday night is my time with Albert and Esme and they always get in bed with me yeah. uh, on either side. Albert's um, eight, Esme's yeah. nearly seven. So Esme's on this side, Albert's on this side. Albert's reading Captain Underpants, Esme's reading <laughs> Rory something, and I'm reading your book. Yeah, wow, and, beautiful. And we lay there reading, and I'm completely, what I love about your book is you are completely put in the child's point of view, the child's experience. So I've got the two most precious things in the world next to me, and they're saying, Dad, what does X and Y mean? You know, yeah. in the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's always an emotional time for me, but yeah. knowing about 
switching from your experience and these two and knowing that that child, and it's and what's wonderful is I think you can probably slightly detach from, yeah. I can, in writing my book, I don't self-pity yeah, yeah, yeah. of Dom. I just think of this person with anorexia, Yes, yeah. who's universal, because I think me and you have, we've got, yeah. got out of it. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. I, just reading, just feeling the love that the, these two children are getting from me and from their mum, and knowing that this child was feeling loveless. It's, so I didn't sleep last night. <laughs> um, it's an extraordinary book, Lev. Thanks. Yeah, well, it was an extraordinary life. It was an extraordinary childhood. It really was. And I, when, I, when I left care, I, was, I, 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 I realized that everybody else was going forward. They were going either to uni or college or to, mainly to jobs, to the dull, you know, the miners had been, you know, like you, the miners had been, that was the backdrop, wasn't it, to our yeah. childhood, really, the end of our childhood, you know, as we came into adulthood, you know, Thatcher came across with a, a flamethrower in the Northwest. Yeah. She set people against people, you know, police, even the police officers, they didn't want to be there. They were part of the same family, some of them. Do you know what I mean? It split families for life. Uh, yeah. there, was, there was people who couldn't be fed. You know, there's food things going around. I think you yep. spoke about that. Um, yep. um, and and, and, and we, we came out of that. So when I came out of care, like half of me was like, what do we do we go on to? Everybody seemed to be going on to their next stage of life. And I was thinking something's bad's happened and I haven't got the language for it. And you haven't got my people in my village haven't got the language to receive it. I, I was chalky white, you know, bloody hell, lad, you know. It's like, all right, chalky, you know, I was, I was that kid, you know, I was a smile, you know, but there was a, there was a thing that I had to, I had to say this happened. And um, then I came to Manchester and was swept up in that, in that energy, you mm. know, which, which you could sort of hide inside almost yeah. and develop your own narrative, you know. But, uh, well, I, I found. I, sorry, I cried at your book. I Go cried at your book because, uh, because um, we're men, you know, and we're from certain backgrounds. But I, I, I was very emotional at your book because, because of what I have not had. When I see, <laughs> when I see it, it, it's it's a very beautiful thing, and I, I know how important it is, and. So, like your your parents get you know sending you a fiver, you know a fiver. Um, it's a love letter. I, I'm not talking about the book really. I, I am talking about you, and I'm talking about me because because this is this is what I didn't have. Okay, and that's fine. I'm all right, as you know. But just to see it in words, you know, mm. you know, love is classless. Mm -hmm. you no. Know? It's classless, and yet it's the classiest thing on earth, right? <laughs> what a great thing to say. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, Len, that's what, that's what happened to me last night. I, I was with the children. I was going, they've got all this love, and this child doesn't have it. Yeah. And yeah. I hope, I was really, Albert in particular is an avid, voracious reader, and I hope he reads the book because they are... <laughs> They've had an awful fracture in a way, but generally yeah. they're very privileged. They're very privileged. And I, I'm see with Albert, he's internalized some of it and stuff. Yeah. And because of my own experiences, that's one thing I'd say about my, um, my breakdown is yeah. that it's the best thing. It's what, what did I say? I came up with something. Oh. The best thing that ever happened to me that I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. Oh, it's beautiful. It, it opened, and now I feel with Albert and Esme and also other people that I meet now, I'm far less judgmental. I'm far kinder because I was looking into just blackness. Uh, mm. it, it humanized me, and I, I feel like whatever them two throw at me, I'm not going to make it about me. Yeah. It's going to be about them. 
you know? Yeah, I do and know. I'm not, not going to panic yeah. Yeah. and make it worse for them yeah. or anybody, friends, you know. That's the gift, isn't it? That's the gift. That's suffering. Yeah, I, yeah I, I, it actually is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel that very strongly with your book. That there's, there's so much suffering and so much pain in it. But one thing I definitely want to say, I thought when I read your mother's letter about how can I get Lem back? Yeah. How I don't want him to suffer this. I don't. Yeah. The strength that and how much she'd achieved already, yeah. the, the work that she'd done, it's clear that that strength was in you. Yeah. I don't read your book in any sense and see weakness and victim. Yeah. I see and, 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 and feel only strength yeah. from you. But of course, it was like when I was, I was in, in, in the psychiatric hospital, uh, yeah. my ward doctor, Catherine, it was amazing. I tried to get myself out. I thought I could get out. I'd been in about yeah. three months and my, I had my review and I chatted to Justin. Pardon? Was it your birthday? Was that the time? Oh, no, that's when I went in. <laughs> but I, I'd been in a while and, and uh, I sat with him and he said, do you, do, you, do you think you're ready to go home now, Chris? And I said, yes. And he went, do you, Chris? And I went, no. And he went, okay. It was brilliant how he handled me. And I went back and I broke down. I was crying my eyes out. And Catherine was leant against the wall. Like, you know, she saw people cry every minute of every day. She was leant across the wall, incredibly empathetic person. And she just went, oh, you'll be all right. You're strong. And I was laughing yeah. because... I've never felt weaker in my life. I was crying my eyes out. And she said to me, look, you know, we didn't have to come and get you. You knocked on the door. And you were always knocking on doors. How you got hold of Marley. That's what I wanted to talk about in our background. I mean, I'm this white kid. You know those estates. I was brought up with all, all the racial, yeah, yeah. you know, God yeah. knows what I would have called you. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. All that. But my fiercest identification was with black American music. Yeah. I remember hearing What's Going On when it first came out, I was seven. But you, what you do in the book, what Marley um, did for you, what you do with him is just brilliant. Thanks, man. Black music is, you know, that's, you know, all my background. There's a lot yeah, of white yeah, really. kids who went to Wigan Casino. Yeah. But we're still racist elsewhere. It's skinheads. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was like a disconnect because um, because this is really important actually, especially now to talk about, I guess, but but it is nuance. You know, your dad, for example, he would fight for anybody and he knew his history and he listened to Paul Robeson and you know, he, he even which he even knew about the Indians within um, within the cowboy and Indian films, and and and, and you know wanted them. He even knew about the history of the Sioux Su, the Sioux Indians who came to Salford. So he yeah. had his pace. You know, he, he was that man who would stand up for you, yeah. and yet you would hear uh, terms that we would now think of as as you know over, overtly racist. Okay, yeah. from now, my dad's I grew, mouth. I, I grew up with those same people. Who would defend me to the hilt? Who, when the police tried to take me when I was 21 years of age, who just trumped up something about me at, at a Howbridge swimming centre? All my friends were the ones who said, "No, you're not having him," you know, and that ended up with us all in a cell. But <laughs> but they were there with me, you know. Um, so it's a lot more. It's a lot more complicated. Uh, it's it's a lot less black and white. You know, so although I was angry with my some of my friends as I was going through my teenage years, at the same time, the guy who introduced me to Bob Marley was was an, a nineteen year old from um, Hagfold Housing Estate. You know, white kid, 
Was he a white kid? Yeah. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how I was brought to Bob Marr. I made a documentary about him on, on Radio 4. In fact, sadly, he's just passed away. He became an addict and, and um, yeah. Um, yeah, so... Yeah, so I think as I've grown, I've learned to know the difference between a racist who would never use a racist term and a person who would use a racist term but actually doesn't know not to and yet will defend any black person. That, that Like it or not, that is out there. Yeah, yeah, I think that's... Um... A very important point. It's nuanced, but what comes across in your book and what's very difficult is is as a developing soul and mind, as you clearly were, to try and understand that somebody will call you chalky white, uh, but still defend you. That's because it throws it threw you back on yourself, didn't it? It's like, what am I doing here? Am I being patronized? Am I being manipulated? We all know how any creative person's soul and sense of themselves is always being dismantled. And you have that added thing of, am I being ungrateful or am I being a sycophant? All this swirling around with no mother and father to. Yeah. Your social worker, Norman, do you still have any, is he still around or? But the final social worker, Norman Mills, who's not the social worker at the beginning, who's Norman yeah. Walker. Okay. So the one who has some emotional intelligence. Yeah. We're, we're friends, man. I've invited him to gigs. You know, I saw him, I was in Chester the other month, I think January or so, and I saw him in the audience. He didn't tell me he was going to be there. And, and I got to say to the audience, you know, he's here tonight, folks. <laughs> and well, I it's just, it's a lovely yeah, man. It's just, it's just, um, it's a very, it's an important component of the book. Yeah. That he, he only, you know, I found myself going, visit, um, I visited Lem today, visited Norman today. I call you Lem in my head. But yeah. I'm always going, well, how many times did you visit? <laughs> Yes. Did you go every week? Yeah. Great, you went with a Christmas present, your birthday present, but you need that, you do need that as a reader because it feels like there's just one person guiding you as a reader who, who has some empathy. I agree. I mean, it took me years to realise it. You know what I mean? Oh, but I'm when, sure. You know, but you when were I angry at him as well, I put you. Pardon? Angry at him as well. Yeah, I was, yeah, because he left as well just before I left care, he just disappeared, which was part of the practice of disassociation, I think, in the, in the social services. Um, but I've been able to make good on all of that. And I've been able to invite him to events and uh, treat him well. And, you know, he has people writing to him now to say, you know, thank you, you know, we need you, we need social workers like you. He represents the best of social work. He did the best he could. You know, it may not have been good enough, but he did the best he could. And that's all you can ask for, you know, of, of a professional in the caring industry. Yeah, he did seem, he does seem, in, in the way you represent in the book, as qualified on an emotional level to at least, to at least. And, and that, to me, it, it hit me again today. The fact that you always told the truth to him. Yeah. That was interesting about the individual. Yeah. You you made a decision. For some reason, this yeah. child went, yeah, okay, I did that. I, I stabbed the bleach bottles. I did that. I'll have somebody in in lieu of mum, I suppose. Yes. Who I'll, I'll, be, I'll be honest with. And that's, about, yeah. that's about you, not him. I mean, in the bad old days, if we made that drama, he'd be the hero of it, you know? Yeah. Pre-Black Lives Matter, it'd be all through the white filter, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's I mean, that, the thing. What? Yeah. Sorry. No, I was just going to say that that wouldn't actually be a bad way of telling the story. But I do get, yeah, pre-Black Lives Matter. Yeah, it would have been all about him being the hero of the entire story. Oh, we'd have seen this little Ethiopian boy. Yes. 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 It, you're right. You're absolutely it, right. Yeah. It would have been very well intentioned. Yeah. But it would have been wrong. 
Yeah. So what, what's, I mean, just bringing us to that, what is fascinating is I had come across, because it's this time, I'd come across Jimmy McGovern before he broke, like a long time before he broke. And he was part of the, um, he was part of the, nobody else is going to make these links, but we can, right? Yeah. He was part of I think People he, know who Jimmy is, but he's yes, huge. Yeah. He's oh, yeah. yeah. It, it was part of the, some, the, the, the community publishers trade organization. And I was in Manchester as well. And, you know, the, the, the pull for me to tell my story, to find a place that wasn't there before, um, for all of us, actually, for you as well. Yeah. And Jimmy McGovern went through that same struggle. Why am I not? Why is this story not of the Dockers, not on my screens? It's the biggest story in my life, you know, yeah. uh, I, I can't see it. You know, and we always think we think we always think somebody else is going to do it. You know, <laughs> you know, we think we've got to fight for somebody to do it. It turns out it's us. Yeah, you know, that's that our responsibility as a generation now because there was just something that allowed me, you, and Jimmy to slip through, uh, and there's less opportunity now. Yeah. Um, so whether we like it or not, we've got to enable others. Because look at the richness that you've brought and Jimmy's brought. I always, in the end, I mean, I've made a contribution, but with writers, yeah. writers are the key in my industry. So, yeah. I first saw Jimmy's work on Brookside, and I'd never watched The Soap before because I had a hatred, as did my parents at Coronation Street. Sorry. Now, can we talk about this? Because that's really, that's actually funny, because that's, that's, why did your parents not like Coronation Street? I totally get it, by the way. Uh, because they didn't feel it was true. And I think they thought they were being smirked at and laughed at. Um, it wasn't gritty enough. It wasn't grey enough. It didn't have nuance. It wasn't, you know. Um, A taste of honey? Would that... They adored taste of honey. They, they, yeah, <laughs> Albert Finney and Saturday night, Sunday morning. Um, this sporting life, all that stuff. Yeah, you know, they both left school at 14. Um, they'd been given a rudimentary education anyway, on purpose, because it was either factory fodder or cannon fodder for them. So naturally, my, my dad's gone now, but my mom yeah. remains to this day an autodidact. She is, her curiosity is ferocious. It's ferocious because, you know, she wasn't given it, so she seeks it out. And to her, Coronation Street and Love Thy Neighbour and stuff like that, that wasn't on either. You know, it was patronising her intelligence. So they instinctively went, no. Yeah. You are your parents' son, man. I think so, yeah. 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 <laughs> and I was given... I was given a much, you know, more opportunities, a better education, more opportunities. You can, but I am actually, I'm very much their parents. I wonder how much you are your mom. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. So do I, actually. I'd love to know. <laughs> I really would love to know. Um, There's a power and a strength and a rigour in, in that child and in you that I think has to be in some, I know I don't want to take away from your own experience of building no. your own personality. There is some genetic, you can feel it in her letter about you. Yeah. I, 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 uh, I agree, okay, I agree. And there was a point in my life um, where I was like, where's this coming from? You know, what, mm. where is this drive coming from? Because it's coming from somewhere. And when it comes down to breaking down, you know, having a breakdown, that's because the drive beyond me is going to happen. I'm going to drive that fast at whatever that thing is that I need to look at, or I'm going to get close to it. That's you know, I can't. I can't not see it. Once I've seen it, I can't not see it. You know, and I didn't have the tools to be able to handle that. And that's when I shut down. You know, that's when I got depression. That's when I couldn't walk out of the house. You know, it was like my 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 brain was going. 
no, this is not, you're not ready, you can't do, you know, you can't handle this. Um, mm. And like you said before, it is the best thing that happened to me because um, it allowed me to take stock and also empathize with others. I think that's, yeah. that's become a really important part of my life. It's very interesting what you've said. I, all my life, through the anorexia, the problems with intimacy, the obsession mm. with exercise, I knew there was something, there was something wrong. Mm. There was something mm. that I was not looking at. And I think you've just articulated it for me in a way. In the end, I, I drove at it and I drove into that yeah. breakdown. And, and I think some people drive into that breakdown and through a number of circumstances, they don't come out. They do go under the train at Piccadilly train station. Yeah. Somehow I didn't. So when you I, 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 this, uh, when you went to, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but when you went on that bridge uh, on, on your run, was it by the, no, it was by a river. And you, you, you know, there was a man stood by the river and he put you shared us you, you asked him what he was doing and he was definitely about to about to jump yeah and then he and you said yeah i know what you mean and then he asks you about your story <laughs> so there's you jogging and then you tell him your you know a glimpse of your story and then he puts his hand on his your shoulder and empathizes with you that moment of you stopping to ask him if he's okay that's what the breakdown can do for a yeah. person you know it makes you stop and say are you okay yeah and, i was in of that is let, saved a life yeah it increases and deepens empathy i i it was around um it was around september of 2016 i'd come out in may of 2016 i was in melbourne getting back to work, I was working on a show called The Leftovers and I was running along the river in Melbourne and I could see this figure 100 yards away from me and he was wayward, he was, and people were doing that thing, they were, were moving away. Mm. And I just kept on my straight line and I remember thinking if, if he comes to me, fine. And, and he was right in front of me so I stopped and I think I said in the book, he had the most beautiful eyes I've ever seen in my life. He had these extraordinary green eyes. I think the suffering was very strong as well, and that light. And yeah, he did, and he ended up looking after me. But I ran off and I thought that might have helped him a tiny bit. Yeah, and I thought that's not about me being a nice guy. Mm -hmm. Who gives a monkeys about mm -hmm. my kindness? It's just, human development or something if we suffer we empathize i hope so this some of this stuff that's gone on has been great about mental health awareness and being able like you are with that book and me yeah. to talk about especially the masculinity stuff that you yeah you yeah know. yeah especially in atherton and sulfur doesn't allow for <laughs> sensitive no. vulnerable poetic men no, it, it doesn't. But um, I think, you know, I, I can go back now and see what I, th I still think that what Margaret Thatcher did to those towns is evil. And I think it's had an effect now. You know, there's yeah. no uh, independent uh, shops anymore. No. You know, the idea of, you know, and that all of that was so that Tesco's could give one VAT bill for a whole town. You know, so there weren't different tax uh, uh, declarations going in from different, you know, people who were independently minded. Yeah. You know, now they can say, right, two Tesco's is a town of this amount of people that consume this much with one bill. Yeah. It's really good for the, uh, you know, for the... Yeah, yeah I think my anger at, at, at that particular government supersedes my anger at the one. The roots of Johnson's government is entirely in her. Yeah. And, but my anger at that, that time, because I know what was destroyed, like you do, sense of community. We'd lived in, in, that, in that estate in Little Alton since 1964. 
nobody touched the house until about 1981, right. two years in. Yeah. And then in the space of, just as mum and dad were getting vulnerable between 81 and 90, they were done three, four times, you know. Yeah. And suddenly their whole, it was alarm in the house and suspicion. Do you not think the drugs, you know, because just after the miners strike, drugs came into the housing estates of the northwest of England in a really big way. So there was then yeah. suddenly there was heroin and there was crime that was like worse than we would ne we would never have expected a crime to be like that. You know, people. Yeah, it was incredibly shocking. I mean, my council estate upbringing was completely idyllic in this. Yeah. In this late late sixties seventies. It was idyllic, and then I saw the the estate change with crime and drugs. And it came at that exact time, you know. I, I remember in 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 Atherton, as the miners' strike finished, yeah, and um, there was this new, really uh, malevolent energy, you know, uh, uh, and addicts who were from the, my generation actually. Um, hey, Marcus Rashford. Oh. <laughs> And uh, yeah, I I think you know I've watched him in the last two games, and I think it might have burnt him out a bit because right. he's missed yep. goal sitters that he would never miss. I think for a young man to have suddenly have achieved that much and to have had that much attention, I mean, you know about being yeah. young, well, and, a little bit, and I do. Yeah, you do. A bit you of really celebrity. Do. Yeah. I, it, it must have drained him a bit. The interviews he gave when he sat on that wall and just it was speaking purely from his soul with, you know, an hour accent, completely unaffected. The power of it. Wonderful. Yeah, it does. It is wonderful. I just want to say I've made a note to mention him to you because yeah. uh, it makes you proud, you know, and it also, uh, yeah, yeah, it makes you proud. Yeah. Um, Dementia. I wanted okay. to talk to you about um, lots of reasons. I'm writing a poem for the National Brain Appeal, and okay. I think that most people don't realise that brain injury affects one in six people. And I, I loved what you said about dementia being. So yeah, I'm coming from this from a personal angle, you know. But but um, the 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 eighth stage of dementia is death, and I, I hadn't I, I hadn't heard that before. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the heading of the football, mm. uh, the leather football, which now mm. is proven, I think, it's yeah. proven now that that will yeah. have affected uh, many I of think, I think Jeff Astle, the footballer Jeff Astle, yeah. who did play for England and West Brom, I think possibly his family were the first to win industrial uh, damages for, from industrial injury, I think. So, so imagine all the ones who didn't do that, you know, who haven't taken that case. You know, so that case is a landmark case, then, right? I think so. I think it was yeah. Jeff Astle, and I think now in youth football, uh, I think they're starting to look at the whole issue of how much they head the ball and, and, and thing. Because, I, as I said in the book, my dad, my dad's nickname was Big Ed, and because he was so good with it, and he mm. played till he was thirty, and it was the big leather ball that used to soak up the water. And he would have um, his head would have crashed with other heads as well because you, part yeah. of heading the ball is you put your head in front of a foot, in front of another head, mm. in front of a goalpost. You know you get cracked all the time. Mm. I also do believe, uh, unlike you and me, my dad was was my dad was naturally very bright and creative, but the lid on him not to be so in masculine terms and in and society's expectations for him turned him into a pressure cooker yeah there was nowhere for this yeah self expression to go yeah and that every time i go on stage i'm playing him you know with yeah. beth or when i do king lear it's it's living with that pressure cooker that will meet my own fellow was uh, 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 you know always playing with language always yeah, the wordplay. Mm. What a gift. And the and your enjoyment of John Cooper Clark and mm. the link with Chicken Town and how Chicken Town relates to yep. a very particular poem. Uh, and didn't you speak to John and tell John about that link? And he was chuffed a bit because, yes, it, it, 
you know, you found the provenance of the poem. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's yeah. right. It's um, it's from um, at the cop. The, there's this. I've got this massive book of war poetry, and there's a chapter called. It's a lovely phrase. The consolations of obscenity. Is 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 how soldiers. John Smith wrote about it brilliantly in a book called Misogynies, The Darker Way, how soldiers always characterize death as a woman uh, and, and, and vaginal and stuff, and how men brutalized in war. And misogyny is it, in order to face that kind of brutality, there's this transposing of death into female which is another right. great argument against war. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, Joan Smith's book, Misogynies, which I read, you know, I came down to London in the 80s. I was, yeah, yeah. You know, and suddenly I'm meeting all these middle-class feminists and going to Compendium Bookshop in Camden Town. <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. It was very tough. It was very tough for me, but it was good for me. It was grassroots in Manchester. That was the women's bookshop on, uh, on Newton Street. And they were fierce and strong and educating. Yeah. And they were on the front line, man. Yeah. Yeah. You and know, we were carrying all that masculine, yeah. like, you know, entitlement and... Yeah. And, and you're like... The, can you talk to me a little bit about the passage in your book when you said about the foster child um, cracks the veneer? Oh, yeah. This is, thanks. That, <laughs> if I took anything away, it's that four or five lines. I, I wish you could find it now. I'm not. But, no, I'm um, just I've got notes on your book everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. You talk that the foster child can expose the faults in a family. Yeah. The, and the only example I have to the foster child exposing the flaws in the family is a child. When you have a child, it will, I don't mean you, I mean generally, when you have a child, if you've got a weak spot in your own head or in your life or in your relationship, let's say you, let's say you have a child but you don't get on with your mum. Okay? Well, that's Mrs. Greenwood and, and no, your foster no. mum's relationship with her mother, right? Yeah. Sorry. But the, the, all I was about to say was that a child... Your child is the one who will go, I love Ganma. Ganma is great. <laughs> if your weak spot is your own mother, then your child will go, I love Ganma. I want yeah. Ganma. If your weak spot's money, it's your child will go innocently, but will go, I want money. Can I have some money for the shop? I want money now. And if, you're, if your undeveloped brain has somehow got an issue with money, it doesn't matter whether you've got money or not, your child will press that button. And this is where you, 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 you can grow up or you can actually go back to your childhood and, and say, no, 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 you can't have any money and you can't see your grandma and your grandma's horrible, you know, blah, 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 blah. So when a foster child comes into the family, they do the same thing. They trigger the parents' weak spots. If you had a child to keep your, your relationship together, your child will pressure that relationship and you will either come together or separate. When you have a foster child, you can blame the child. You can say, oh no, this is not us, this is you. Yeah. And that's what happens to foster children. And then they'll say, oh, it was a challenging child. That's what children uh, do. Oh, yeah. You yeah. understand me? That, that's what I wanted to. Uh, that's, the, well, that's why I wanted to speak to you about it. Because in the end, it gets down to what that thought and that passage talks about is Nate, um, Nature, nurture. This, I love Albert and Esme. Yeah. But if I'd have been caring for Albert and Esme, if I was given Albert, I'd, I don't believe I would have loved them more. I'd loved them less. Yeah. yeah. And it, 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 it gets to that, but it, 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 addre it, uh, it addresses that issue yeah. of... of Blood's thicker than water, all that yeah. shite. Yes, it is. Yeah, is. I've seen the best ad adopted parents 
you know, like the best foster children who are having a great time with their foster parents. And it's not just a fun time. It's a parent-child relationship, you know. It, it mm. is, that's what it is. And that's yeah. complex. And that's, you know, dark and light and laughter and tears yeah. and everything. Dysfunction and function, you know, parties yeah. and, and uh, uh, tantrums. That's the nature of family. And um, I've seen some, so many beautiful adopters and adopted children that you can't tell me that it doesn't work. You know, mm. you can't tell me that it doesn't work. Is it more rigorous now? Hopefully it's more rigorous because clearly that family, uh, and I don't want to demonize them and you don't because you, what's great in the book is, is you identify that the woman, the, the mother, your foster mom in particular had issues with her yeah. mother and her perception. And you, my mom adopted, so I will adopt not because I want to adopt, but because I feel I should. Yeah, yeah. You know, when people talk about rings, in all kinds of rings, and I don't want to even mention the word, but that's all it is. It's dysfunctional families doing something, and then somebody else in the family doing something, and then it becomes a ring, okay? Yeah. And so children in care are the ones who get pulled into this situation. It is still happening. There is a lot of good practice going on, Chris, um, we're more aware of children in care now than we were when when I was a kid. It was like, oh, that's the big bad. That's where the bad boys go. You know, the children's home was. That's how they. The same and that, like, yeah. yeah, right. So that's no longer around, and I think you know I want to be part of that. I, I'm not really bothered about changing government laws. That's to the politicians and the the old parliamentary groups, but changing public opinion. You know. Moses was 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 adopted, you know. Superman was a foster child. Harry Potter was fostered. Peter Pan was parentless and orphaned. Look at Lord of the Flies, Lisbeth Salander, the girl with the dragon tattoo. As you look in, it, it, you see, it's it's culture. It's culture where change happens. It's culture that changes public opinion. It's our friends in the north that tells the true story. It's Harry Potter that tells the story of kids in care. It's JK Rowling who speaks of, of what it is to be a child and be beyond, you know. Mm. Do, you, do you get an opportunity to walk into care homes now, do some poems, speak? Yeah, I did, I did the last thing. I mean, I'm careful though. We have to be careful about being positioned by others. I think in, in in my, you know, when we're trying to do something good, we have to be careful about what it is, what good are we doing? Is it good for me to walk into a children's home to look at it? You know, what service can I give? Oh, and, I don't mean to look at it. I mean, if you did a poem or... Yeah, I, I did um, a documentary on, on, on Channel 4 uh, called Super Kids, and where I worked with a group of kids, which is what I do, uh, who are in care to get them to write poems. Um, and um, the reason I did that documentary is because years ago, I, I used to do workshops in schools and I, I just, I love teaching. It, I love teaching. But I realized that I was, I was either doing it for a little bit of more money or I wasn't being surprised by it anymore. And as a teacher, it's really important to be inspired by the people that you're teaching. And to be inspired by the people that are teaching, you have to be open. You can't think, oh, I know exactly how this is going to go. Mm. And, yeah. um, and, and so I stopped and I would only work with young people in care um, because I thought, I've got to specialise. And because of that decision, which lost me a lot of work, I made the documentary Super Kids, which is still on Channel 4, which was BAFTA nominated, RTS nominated, and Grierson nominated. And the re it didn't win any of them. But the reason I'm saying that is because that then tells that story to the wider public mm -hmm. through those young people's voices. Mm -hmm. And that's what that was about. So, sorry, it's a long answer to a cracking question. But, yeah, I do, but I want to do it from the side of creative. Yeah, I no, I get that. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 I occasionally I'm asked to go somewhere and they start they start giving me a tour of the building. Yeah. And they're going, this and I'm and I, I've stood there going, oh yes. 
it's so strange. So I'm very careful. I'd say, well, can we be absolutely and utterly specific about what I'm going to do? So you're not ticking a box with me. And, yeah. and more importantly, the kids, because I've been to into a couple of interesting places, you know, um, high security places, and uh, and they're watching you. That those those children watch you just like I watch. From the minute you enter, they're watching. To if go. you're walking across the car park, they'll have yeah. seen you. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that the eyes are always on you. So you say to the people in charge, look, don't have me walking around here like the Lord Mayor. It's great. It's great the difference we can make. And um, it's exactly the same in that workshop that I gave as it is when you visit that school, as it is when you stop the guy on the riverside. Yeah. You know, all of this is linked. I, 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 it's all linked. Um, yeah. Both the breakdown and the gig. You know, yeah. when people ask me what success is, I will say, it, it is actually no I'll ask you what what is success to you what is success to you the you of you Chris, to Chris Eccleston uh, success I, I think like any developing ego I had all the the uh, fixation on 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 wine and women and song and recognition but in the end success to me is that I can do something like this I can express myself. My mum and dad, my mum does it still in the kitchen, but it's private. My dad never got a chance to express himself. The success for me is that I might be asked to read a poem on Radio 4, and it will be my interpretation of that poem. It's got validity. I just feel, it's as you say, I just want to do it in a, in a creative way. Yeah, uh, just success for me is just I'm allowed to play. <laughs> well, you know what we were saying then when I go on a set or, or into a theatre, a friend of mine said this at a director's workshop. Said you've got to understand, young directors. They said actors are watching you all the time. It's not just when you're directing them. It's how you speak speaking to stage management. It's how you walk into the room. It's what you do with the biscuits when we're having a tea break. And if you do all that right, they'll take everything. But if you're a bit of a bully or you're a bit selfish and then you go play it like this, they'll, they'll just go, no. The same as them kids. It's a bit of a sidetrack, but it's no. true, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, no, no, absolutely. I mean, as an actor, you're getting in touch with your, with your, 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 your digging in and kids yeah. are already there. Aren't they? Yeah. Kids are already, yeah, right. they're already in the action, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you go into a care home and start talking about your poems, and they're, yeah. they're interested in the poetry, they're interested in you. So true. I've and got what's to... going on inside you? What's he? What's in it for him? What's he getting out of this? That's what yeah. they're doing because they're rigorous. And it, and 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 if you answer that question positively, then they're changed very slightly it's like well he did that because he enjoys doing it because he's interested in me wow I, 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 I'm slightly changed now by Len and then throw the book at him and something positive comes out of, of, of that little boy's battle so this is this isn't it this is the crux of it all in that moment of, of that person looking to see what they see in you, that, that what they see in me, um, you first, I first have to be connected with exactly why I'm there in that in that place. Yeah, I have to be truly connected to that, and that yeah. translates to stage. That translates to yeah. actually, particularly performatively. Actually, there is this ninja space. Uh, great sure phrase, right? Yeah, you know, and it's as much as um, it's as much as in the A word, difficult as that is, you know, as it is for me um, in a workshop. Which, if you if you see Super Kids, I'm going to get you the link, man. Oh, I'll, I'll find it. You don't have to. And is it going to be revisited that, Len? Are you going to re 
Are you going to revisit we, that? We, we may well do. We may well do. Be, uh, we may well like do. Twenty one, like for twenty one up. Funny enough, we've spoken about exactly that with a production company. It's a, called Factual Entertainment, Factual Expectation. Um, uh, but those kids looked at me to say, uh, with exactly as you said it, actually, I don't need to go over it again. It's exactly as you said it. And that slither of light, you know, if you as an artist, if I'm in that, those kids are like, okay, we'll give you, you have more time to become more of what we think we saw. And we're pretty sure we did. Mm. You know what I mean? We're pretty sure we saw it. So step up, you know? Yeah. And, and that intensity that you had as a child that drove you into the breakdown that I had as a boy in my book, that mm. you had, you know, that you explained there, that's in everything that you do as an artist. Mm. Even if it's questioning, am I right for this role? Should I be doing this? Mm. You know, that that attention to the detail of your spirits and of why you're there, why I'm here, why I'm doing what I'm doing, that's everything. Mm. And again, that's also classless, mm. you know, and classy. It, getting this point across as well, it, at the moment is difficult because unlike when we were growing up, Celebrity was was commoditized to a certain extent, but now in a in a huge way with, yeah. with the talent show. So I, I've been back to my old drama school a few years ago, and I, I was I, I was amazed. I wasn't really asked any questions about how I felt about Shakespeare or Chekhov or had I read Stanislavski, or I was just asked how do you socially network and 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 it. it it, I don't know what I'm trying. What am I trying to say here? It's it's the slither of light. It's the ninja space. I wanted to go there and have the slither of light examined, yeah. um, or the ninja space invaded, yeah. and like, um, and it, it. So it's more important that we, because I'm used to going on sets now, and there'll be younger actors. I'm 56 now, and yeah, yeah. and I've some of them are like, whoa, you know, you're. Yeah. And I know immediately that the most important thing I can do is is, is be genuinely like, I don't know how the hell I got here. Uh, yeah. uh, and be vulnerable and like, yeah. uh, and just say, it was hard graft. Uh, I, I worked hard and I listened a lot. But I'm doing it for the slither of light. Obviously at 20, you start dreaming of Oscars, but there's a yeah. point where you go, forget all that yeah i'm being allowed to play and if i sometimes you can pass that on to younger people younger actors in you know lads who think i'm a bit macho which i'm yeah. i'm not yeah and that you can change them ever so slightly and and you know they'll come up to me on set and go I'm a bit nervous about doing this scene with you and i go well i'm quite nervous about doing the scene with you too and you can see them, oh, we're equal it's passing the message that we're equal yeah, yeah, yeah. Which doesn't always happen when there's power and money around yeah. in the arts and status. But you've 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 maintained that, uh, and you've protected that um, kind of radical vulnerability mm. um, uh, and that sense of uh, artist at work, uh, mm. creative at work. You know, come in, but we're working, um, and. Um, and I've, I've, I've really tried to do that in a much smaller way in terms of uh, its reach, but I think it's the same energy, yeah. you know, the same vibe. And actually, the, the, the macho thing doesn't work because it, it, it assumes that the opposite is soft. And actually, it's a hard man that can stop on a bridge and put their hand on a, on, you know, and, and speak to the man that, that may be jumping off it or jumping into the river. You know, it's mm. a hard guy that can stand in front of a group of kids, and if they're going to not play ball, he'll be okay with that, and he'll work with it and around it, and it's, it's part of it. But this, this to me is, this it is the it is the matrix. It's the ninja way. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. it it's cool. interesting because I think my dad had he experienced that man by the river in in Melbourne, everything inside him 
would have wanted to do that, but he wouldn't have wanted to embarrass himself. There'd have been a self-consciousness. But it was my dad that did it. You know, it, in me, it was, I, I've gone, because of my experience with the breakdown, I've gone, it's okay. It's, I'll do that, I'll do, I'll do this. But what's nice for me is I know my dad, my dad's natural empathy was, was present and society allowed me, for whatever reason, to be able to go, I don't care what people think about me as a man touching another man's face. Mm. I don't care because I know who I am now, finally. Yeah. There's a, a line in the book and it has got something to, to do with people can say, in your book, that is, people can say that my father, people would, would often say, you know, that their father lived his life through his son. But you said that I lived my life through my dad. Mm. Something like that. It was a beautiful flip of that, that cliche, you know. Oh, the father yeah. looks at his son and thinks, bloody hell, he's done well. You know, and he lives his life through his son. But you, you, you turned it around. And I thought, I thought, you see, my book is also a gift to my mum to say, I know how much you went through. I know how difficult it is to you to communicate with me because of everything that you've been through. But I get it. You're OK. You know, and your book seems to be saying both to your mum. Your mum's just a beautiful presence in the book. I, I don't, yeah. you know, I'm not having the pleasure to have met her once I have. But your book. Did you meet her? Did you yeah, meet her at the Holocaust? Holo the, the, Holo Holo the Europe. The Europe. Oh, she she came. In Salford, man. I know. But the first time we met was at the Holocaust Memorial Night. That's in right. 2001, 2002. That's right. That's right. And I just remember meeting this incredibly handsome, charismatic guy. <laughs> and you were you, you were a little bit, and yeah. I know now that you said to me, I said, what were you up to last night? You've been in the press club. <laughs> <laughs> and then the last time we met, you told me that you'd, uh, I, I think it's okay to say you stopped yeah, drinking, yeah. haven't you? I stopped drinking, yeah. Yeah. Best thing I ever did for me. I mean, that just, you know, that explains it. Uh, yeah, just Do you remember the yeah, yeah, that time, I remember remember that time. I was meeting Christopher Eccleston, man. In well, I, I was meeting Len Sisse, it was great, <laughs> and we had the same accent, <laughs> and we were both a little bit roguish, yeah, yeah, just a little bit, yeah, yeah, as is everybody who's experienced the press club, yes, yeah. <laughs> um, oh, I was saying the club, something the club <laughs> that time forgot. <laughs> That was great. Yeah, it was great. Sliver great. of light, ninja space. <laughs> well, my quote from you is, um, uh, how can we get make Lem bigger? Christopher Eccleston, that's going on. <laughs> and she said, Lem will naturally get bigger. <laughs> I'm sure he will. Good work. Are we, going to say, are we going to say goodbye and stay yeah, in touch, goodbye. please? I'll send all my contacts to you. Yeah. And thank you. This. I yes. want this. I. I want my mum to read this. Oh, I'd love that. This is it. Yeah, I, I'm going to send it to her from Amazon, and I want Albert and Esme to read this. Those are the three most important people in my life. And I know, because I know those people, that it will change the way they perceive things. So thank, thank you for this. Thanks, man. This, um, this reminded me of everything that um, – I'm going to tell you the truth. This reminded me of everything that uh, I wanted, um, which was two uh, people dedicated to their children and their son. Oh, well, I'd like, you can say that to my mum. I love you, pal. Yeah, you too, man. I love you too. And I'll see you love soon. You. See you soon. And I'll send my details to, uh, to, to... We'll do it. Easy to do. Yeah, okay. See you. Thank you. How did you feel when writing your autobiography, especially when dealing with the aspects trauma and of mental health uh well because there was so much um uh shame 
uh, attached to anorexia and depression uh, um, and, and, and elements of, of mental health and vulnerability because I was northern and working class and male. It was like an enormous weight was lifted off me because I'd been speaking to journalists about dramas for 30 years and I was sitting on these secrets about my dad's mental health, my own mental health, my anorexia. So at the time of putting it down on paper, it was a huge release. But when I was publicizing the book, I did get caught up a bit again in body image things and my eating went awry. Uh, and I found the publication of the book painful. But ultimately, the fact that I can walk down the street, a football fan, and, you know, who likes a drink and, you know, likes women and is a male shape, but has come clean about all this vulnerability in what might be called stupidly feminine areas, I feel released and, and, and much happier in myself. Cracking. Cracking? Why did I say cracking? Sorry, that was a... No, it's a good one. No. That's what we say. Bloody <laughs> cracking. <laughs> What would be the most important piece of advice you have for a teenager growing up in care today? It's a big question that, I don't know if you can it's do it. It's a really big question. Um, well, the thing that I wish I'd have been able to do, oh, what would be the one most piece of important, okay, the one most important piece of advice for a teenager growing up in care today is do everything you can to get and buy your first place. And the reason that I say that very deliberately is somebody's got to tell you to aspire to something, right? So aim to buy your own place in the first, like, seven, 10 years of you after you've left care, between 18 and 28. Buy a flat if you can, or a house if you can. Work towards that as your goal. And if that means renting a place first, but have your own space so, you, so that you're in your own care. You know, nobody told me to aspire, Chris. Nobody, no, I know, that's you know, clear. In families, you can look at your family, you think, okay, we've not got this, we should have that, I, I'm going to get that, whatever. But when I was in care, nobody aspired for me. There was no example. You know, I didn't know about actually buying a place until I was in my 30s. It's the power of association. I had no association. Mm -hmm. So at least, you know, the most important thing is to have people aspire for you, you know, to tell you to mm -hmm. go in that direction. Anyway, that's a great piece of advice. 